good afternoon to everybody. Uh, so as advertised, my name is uh, Alberto Park, and um, I am indeed a, a Science Foundation Fellow uh, and uh, still currently uh, at Columbia University working with Molly Shaborsky, uh, but, uh, opening uh, my own lab uh, soon. And of course, you know, back when this seminar was scheduled, I, I certainly dreamed I'd be able to, to give it in person and uh, visit Vienna again. Uh, but, you know, nonetheless, I'm uh, really excited to be talking to all of you today um, and uh, also looking forward to meeting some of you in person uh, later today and tomorrow. So uh, today I'd like to, to tell you a story that is uh, somewhat of a synthesis of uh, three or four research papers. Uh, it's either published or in the works, uh, and it will uh, consist of uh, three vignettes, I guess, uh, about the, the rise and fall of uh, signals of uh, polygenic adaptation in humans, as uh, Christian has uh, touched upon, um, and also uh, signals of, uh, sorry, polygenic signals and the environment more generally. Uh, so both of this, one and two, are uh, will touch on methods and, and data, uh, and if time permits, which is, uh, I think, a big if, because uh, I certainly want to leave some time for questions and discussion. Uh, so if time permits, we'll, we'll discuss, uh, sorry. Uh, a third vignette that looks beyond uh, this questions about methods and, and data challenges, and we'll ask uh, what true signals of uh, polygenic adaptation uh, can tell us about human evolution and also what they cannot. So I want to start with um, what is also my last slide and perhaps the most important one uh, to uh, acknowledge the people that I've been fortunate to collaborate on, uh, on all of this work, uh, including uh, Molly Shaborsky, my uh, current advisor, uh, and uh, Jonathan Pritchard, my PhD advisor, as well as uh, Graham Coop at UC Davis, uh, Doc Edge at uh, University of Southern California, uh, Hamanesh Mustafavi at Stanford, and um, others that have had uh, key contributions to actually several parts of this work. Okay, so however uh, one might uh, define distinct human populations, uh, they will always have uh, relatively low levels of uh, differentiation uh, between these populations and uh, perhaps uh, an even smaller number of meaningful differences are driven by uh, by natural selection. Uh, nevertheless, the differences continue to be of great interest, uh, partly because of their potential to, uh, to explain how humans have been able to occupy such a diverse range of uh, environments and niches. But despite this interest, there are still relatively few well understood examples of human adaptation. And our overall picture of human adaptation is quite clouded. Um, and, you know, the past couple of decades, we've seen an explosion, uh, certainly in uh, genetic data, uh, that brought about the, the, the hope that if we develop the appropriate statistical tool and match it, of course, with the right theoretical uh, model of, of evolution, uh, we'll get more than a handful of concrete examples and also get closer to the true story of human adaptation. So, you know, let's start with what, what evolutionary theory uh, indeed tells us about, sorry. Okay, are you still with me? Everything all right. Okay, just, okay. I got a pen uh, like cursor, uh, but I think everything's all right. Um, no, I can't. I can't change the slide now. Okay. Why don't you unshare? Okay. okay. I think it's working now. Okay. So, uh, what does evolutionary theory tell us about what to expect? So, um, so I think you know the cartoon image of uh, natural selection that most of us start off with that. You know, intro to evolution is uh, that of monogenic adaptation uh, through, in the simplest case, hard uh, selective sweeps, and uh, where we have this beneficial mutation that lands on one of the genetic backgrounds in the population, uh, represented by different colors here. And 
if this mutation has been official enough, uh, it's, it will also sweep to a higher frequency of the population, perhaps even uh, sweep to fixation. And the, most importantly, we, we can model and search and, and detect this very strong signal of uh, selective sweep, uh, namely a rapid and a large change in allele frequency in uh, one locus. And, you know, and we can even do this in contemporary population. So this gives us a way uh, forward to characterize recent adaptation. But while thinking about adaptation in terms of monogenic selective sweeps is helpful in some organisms and populations, in other contexts, uh, such as the, the, the context of adaptation in recent human evolution, uh, this is uh, far from being the pervasive mode of, a pervasive mode of adaptation. And what we should instead tune our expectations to is polygenic adaptation. And this is uh, simply because uh, most human traits of interest are uh, indeed polygenic or complex, meaning that they're affected by many different sites in the genome. So if we have such a, a polygenic trait, uh, what theory to teach, teaches us to, to expect uh, is that the trait is highly polygenic uh, and it's undergoing genetic adaptation, it will happen through, um, not through this, uh, large changes in uh, one uh, large effect locus, uh, but rather we will see instead a subtle shift in frequency at many of the sites uh, that affect the trait, uh, typically the ones that will have um, a small marginal contribution to, to the uh, trait. So, uh, now, now, now that we've set our, you know, qualitative expectation to polygenic adaptation, uh, we, we also need to admit that uh, it's going to be much harder to detect the subtle changes across many sites, um, especially compared to the, you know, flashing neon light that is selective sweeps. So uh, the approach uh, for detecting polygenic adaptation has been to uh, weigh the evidence across sites in, in the blue axis here. So this can be some population genetic statistic, statistic. Uh, weigh it by the uh, site's effect on the trait, what I'm denoting by beta evidence. So uh, the, the question moving forward is what, we can, what can we use to, uh, to estimate the effect of a site on a trait? And of course, uh, the, the field attention uh, turned to the workhorse of uh, complex trait research uh, which is genome-wide association studies, uh, where we associate variation in a trait uh, with a genetic variant. So if, for example, we have this um, a, a continuous trait, uh, we can actually estimate the uh, effect of adding one additional B allele uh, simply by the average effect uh, that we observe here. So, I'm uh, sorry. So uh, genome-wide association studies are uh, are great in the sense that uh, for whatever trait that we can define and measure, uh, we can also look for genetic variation that may explain observed trait variation. However, for, for someone with an interest in understanding the genetic basis of complex traits and also their evolution, there are just two minor issues that uh, bother me somewhat with genome-wide association studies, and that is uh, that they're genome-wide and that they're association studies. So uh, let me backtrack a bit and, and, you know, say exactly what I mean by, by this, and I'm uh, going to perhaps start with the, the second part, the association study part. So as the name suggests, uh, GWAS tests for correlation, and uh, there is a potential problem that we're all aware of where Correlation is, is not causation. And uh, perhaps the, the strongest manifestation of correlation not being uh, genetic uh, causation is in the issue of uh, so-called population structure confounding. So this refers to the myriad ways by which we can get uh, correlation between one's ancestry and uh, the trace value. So um, as a, as a, as a quick example, uh, we can consider performing a GWAS for a trait like asthma uh, in the United States, uh, where we have uh, samples that's composed of both 
European Americans and African Americans. And, you know, because of a combination of two facts, uh, one that we have many variants in the genome that are going to tag one's ancestry, and then also that uh, that ancestry will be correlated with uh, important exposures. So, for example, uh, African Americans are much more likely to, in the United States, to live in areas of poor air quality, uh, which is an important exposure for asthma. Uh, we're going to get this correlation between air quality and the genotype. And uh, therefore, also between the genotype and the uh, phenotype asthma. So, in the extreme, we will reach the conclusion that African American alleles, uh, African American alleles, actually predispose uh, for for asthma. Uh, but perhaps more realistically, this will drive some bias, uh, maybe large, maybe small, uh, in the effect estimates of individual alleles. So, you know, of course, I should note. Uh, that there are, uh, as you're all aware, standard methods to correct for population structure. Uh, so uh, the, the, perhaps the most straightforward one is instead of regressing a phenotype to a, to a genotype, uh, we can add as a covariate uh, proxy for one's ancestry and uh, therefore uh, help to correct for, for the for population structure uh, confounding. And actually, this method worked really well for, for what GWAS was designed to do, uh, which is not to estimate the precise effect, uh, effect size of that individual size, uh, but rather just to identify the one or few golden loci in the genome that uh, underlie trait variation in a monogenic or maybe oligogenic uh, trait. But, you know, unfortunately, as I already alluded to, this is not the case uh, for uh, so many of the diseases and traits that we want to study, uh, which are instead polygenic or highly polygenic. And, and, th and there are several uh, traits. Uh, sorry, so, so you know, the, I guess the, the poster child for complex traits in, in humans is, uh, has been for uh, nearly a century now uh, human height. And uh, recently in their uh, omnigenic paper, Jonathan Richards and colleagues have estimated that, in fact, 63% uh, of uh, independent linkage blocks, uh, independent LD blocks in the human genome, uh, contain a variant that causally affects height. So, a truly uh, highly polygenic. Um, and, indeed, you know, height has not only been the, the poster child for uh, polygenic uh, uh, for a polygenic trait in general, but uh, also recently for uh, for polygenic adaptation, uh, and this is simply because we see you know interesting patterns of uh, differentiation and height uh, all over the world. And now, uh, for example, in Europe, and uh, what I'm showing you here is the, the mean male height in different European countries. Uh, we see this uh, interesting variation. Uh, that perhaps the, the trend that most immediately pops pops out is uh, this north to south gradient where northern Europeans are taller than uh, southern Europeans. And, you know, this brings about the question if these patterns are due to the to environmental or genetic differences uh, or by some complex combination of the two. Uh, and, you know, if there are genetic, if there is a genetic contribution, uh, to what extent is it uh, driven by selection rather than just arriving through uh, random genetic risk, for example. So, uh, indeed, in the last uh, um, decade or so, there has been uh, ample evidence for uh, that high differentiation in Europe uh, is, uh, at least in part, due to uh, genetics and uh, further that is due to uh, polygenic adaptation um, in half. So, so, what I'm going to show you here is just uh, one example. Um, but I'd like to note that uh, this has been the conclusion of several independent analysis by uh, independent groups. So what we see here, uh, each data point corresponds to uh, a sample, a subpopulation from a subpopulation in Europe uh, in a specific country with its corresponding latitude on the x-axis. And what I have on the y-axis that I'm calling a polygenic score for height so at the individual level, uh, what a polygenic score is, uh, it's 
in the simplest form, it's just the sum of the alleles carried by an individual multiplied by the estimated effect of each allele on uh, the trait in question, where we get the effect estimate from a GY. And, you know, what a polygenic score estimates, uh, in fact, is it's the, the additive genetic component of variation in a trait. Uh, and, but this is all in the individual, uh, at the individual level. And as I uh, mentioned, each data point here corresponds to a subpopulation or a sample from the subpopulation from a particular place in Europe. So we're going to replace this individual allele count with uh, the allele frequency in the sample. So this is exactly the type of statistic that I uh, mentioned previously, where the, the population genetic statistic, uh, the evidence for adaptation, here it's going to be the differentiation of allele frequencies along uh, latitude in Europe, is uh, weighted by the estimated effect of uh, the site on a trait. And indeed, so I'm not going into the statistical analysis here, uh, but uh, the fact that after using the standard methods to correct for population structure, our estimate of the, the trend at the genetic level uh, mirrors what we saw at the phenotypic level, namely a strong correlation with latitude in Europe, suggests that selection has acted to differentiate height along, latitudinal, along this latitudinal line, um, because otherwise, through genetic drift alone, uh, we would not expect this uh, near monotonic change in polygenic scores uh, along latitude. So, you know, just to mention where the data is taken from, so the allele frequencies are taken primarily from this thousand genome data set, uh, and these effect estimates are coming from what was until uh, quite recently, until a few years ago, the largest GWAP score. Uh, for for height from uh, by the giant consortium, uh, and giant is actually a meta analysis combining uh, data from European countries and diverse European ancestries. Uh, but since uh, giant came out, we've also entered the uh, biobank era, and data sets like the UK biobank came out. That uh, so the UK biobank uh, data, for example, has a huge sample of half a million uh, individuals, all uh, residents of the, the UK at the time of the sampling. So, you know, so even uh, a priori, we, we can perhaps be uh, more concerned about the, the diverse ancestry here than the uh, more homogeneous ancestry that we'll have here uh, in, in terms of uh, potential uh, population structure confounding. Uh, and the UK Biobank data, you know, it's not only height or uh, anthropometric uh, traits. It actually has uh, hundreds of traits measured, measured in this uh, half a million individuals. So when, when it came out, I was, of course, you know, uh, very excited about the opportunity to extend our observation uh, on height and test for polygenic adaptation uh, in various other traits. But uh, first things first, I wanted to, uh, my colleagues and I wanted to see if the trends that we saw for, for height indeed replicate when we use this uh, new, shiny, uh, cleaner data. But instead what we saw was that the, the trends uh, almost entirely or entirely disappeared when we used uh, UK Biobank uh, GWAS. So here the, the, the trend completely flattens out, and I want to you know, emphasize that the only thing that uh, differs between these two panel, panels is uh, the effect size estimates that we're using. So the allele frequencies remain the same, but uh, we're using here the UK Biobank uh, effect estimates rather than the giant one. And we were, of course, you know, uh, very uh, very concerned when we, we saw this, uh, uh, the, the all of the, the trends uh, that we previously observed disappear when we use this new data. And as I already alluded to, you know, our um, um, immediate suspect that we had in mind was, of course, uh, population, what was residual population structure confounding in giant that, that was driving the previous uh, observations. And, and I should note that we didn't necessarily have an hypothesis on 
what is driving this confounding issue. It is, for example, some environmental factor that changes along latitude and affects height, as we had in the asthma case. Um, but whatever it may be, because of the strong correlation between ancestry and height at the phenotypic level, uh, we can, you know, at least in retrospect, expect uh, this pesky correlation between uh, genotype and, and height uh, at the many sites in the genome that tag ancestry along uh, north-south uh, axis. So, you know, and it's, this is going to be difficult to fully correct for. And, you know, I think this is a nice case study in the sense that uh, we can identify and name the, the axis of genetic variation in which we suspect uh, residual stratification uh, that, that flip through the crack. Uh, but generally speaking, axis of uh, stratification may be uh, much more elusive uh, than in this case. So, you know, we also wanted to, to look at this more directly and ask if we see evidence of uh, such stratification at the, at the level of individual variants. So each data point here in the part that I'm showing now is just an individual variant that is used in the apologetic score for height uh, that I uh, plotted previously. And the x-axis shows the allele frequency difference between British and the Italian, uh, which is a proxy for this north to south gradient. And on the y-axis, we see the difference in effect size estimated in giant compared to um, minus the one that we estimated in, in biobank. And uh, what we can see is that, indeed, more northern alleles are associated with a larger effect size uh, in giant compared to uh, the biobank. And, and this is, indeed, consistent with residual uh, population structure confounding in the giant data set. So, you know, to, to conclude this first part, uh, while data and methods are, you know, are, are improving uh, as we speak, I think the, the unavoidable conclusion here is that um, population structure confounding is uh, currently an unsolved problem. And uh, this paper and a companion paper by uh, Suhail and, and, and Meyer et al. Uh, from our colleagues at the Broad Institute who have reached similar conclusions simultaneously uh, were published only last year, and examined uh, two of the largest GWAS that the community had for the complex trait that uh, arguably we thought that we, we had the best handle on. So, you know, I think this conclusion is uh, far, has a far broader reach than just for people who are interested in uh, polygenic adaptation. So I'd like to uh, also, you know, come back to this last slide that I showed you, and Led me to a little cheat that I use here, uh, just by plotting this, you know, orange linear fit. Uh, I think if actually if I wasn't to, to plot this this, uh, this linear fit, it would have been increasingly difficult to see that anything at all is going on in this scatter plot here. Uh, but in fact, this is exactly the reason why I like showing this plot, and that is that uh, to me it uh, illustrates how at the individual at the level of individual variance the biases that I'm talking about may be uh, actually tiny, but uh, when we're summing over the, the signal genome-wide, um, you know, we are also summing over this tiny biases. So if this bias is acting in some systematic way, uh, this can lead to, uh, you know, large misinterpretations. So, you know, this, this is a good segue to the second part of, uh, of the talk because, and, and also, you know, uh, perhaps, you know, close the circle on, on where I started with uh, this fundamental problem with genome-wide plus association studies, uh, meaning that, you know, the fact that GWSR association studies was not uh, such a huge problem before we uh, started trying to integrate genome-wide over this weak correlation. Um, but, you know, in the second vignette, I'll, I'll follow up on how analysis that use polygenic scores can further uh, lead to misinterpretations when when the tiny but systematic biases uh, exist, and also some ways forward to detect and prevent uh, such uh, misinterpretation. Okay, so uh, we will now uh, not think of polygenic scores only as uh, estimators of uh, you know, the, roughly speaking, the genetic effect on a trait, uh, 
um, but more as you know, predictors of trade value uh, in previously unobserved individuals, uh, where we simply you know, plug in the, the genotype of this individual in blue here uh, into a previously estimated polygenic score function. So, you know, such uh, applications for prediction are not only useful for uh, studying the evolution of complex human traits, uh, but perhaps, you know, most importantly uh, for their application for human health. So, you know, a key application um, that, that uh, polygenic scores are promised to provide is uh, in, um, you know, having a polygenic score distribution for uh, for some disease, such as coronary artery disease, and, you know, identifying people that lie at the tail of this uh, polygenic score distribution as carrying a risk factor for, uh, for the disease that we can uh, consider in a clinical setting. Uh, but polygenic scores uh, are, you know, are promising in more than just uh, human health, uh, and perhaps the more uh, surprising for some uh, more surprising applications, such as in social sciences uh, with behavioral and uh, social traits, and uh, as well as policy making, uh, and even uh, more controversial applications of object scores and things like uh, embryo selection. But you know, I would argue that underlying virtually all of this uh, uses of polygenic scores as predictors uh, is this premise that polygenic scores largely uh, capture some direct causal uh, genetic predisposition of, of an individual uh, for the trait. But in, instead, you know, GWAS, uh, GWAS estimates and polygenic scores in turn capture more than just direct genetic effects. So we have also saw, you know, this main example of population structure confounding or stratification. Um, but there are other factors that are being absorbed in polygenic scores, uh, such as uh, indirect genetic effects or, uh, or dynastic effects. So, you know, most of you are uh, familiar with this if you've uh, worked on other organisms, but in uh, human genetics, you know, they've actually only uh, recently came into the spotlight. So the basic idea is that, you know, part of the environment that matters for a trait uh, can be the, the environment set by the parent, the parental environment. And which we can, you know, um, um, together call this nurturing phenotype uh, for the focal phenotype that we're studying. And this nurturing phenotype may have a genetic basis in itself that indirectly contributes to the focal trait in the child. So, and this is also called a dynastic effect, as I mentioned. Now, the reason that dynastic effects are important in the context of a standard GWAS that we've been discussing so far is that when we estimate the effect of this A allele in an association study, uh, we're also capturing the fact that, you know, this A allele was inherited from a parent that and may have had this indirect effect on, on the trait. And in fact, uh, in standard GWAS, what we'd be estimating is, in expectation, is the sum of the direct effect and the indirect effect. So, you know, this has been uh, mostly highlighted um, for behavioral traits, for example, in this uh, Nature uh, Nurture paper by uh, Kong et al., uh, talking about, you know, the, the, parent, the parental contribution, genetic contribution to um, traits such as educational attainment. Um, but I want to, you know, to highlight the fact that this can uh, matter for uh, physical traits that are just the same. So, for example, Warrington et al. have recently showed that, um, you know, a lot of the heritability that uh, was detected in uh, genome-wide association studies for our birth weight can actually be explained through this indirect path. Uh, specifically, um, they argue through effects on maternal blood pressure that indirectly affect the birth weight of the, the child. So, you know, like certification and uh, dynastic effect. Uh, there are also uh, effects that uh, have to do with um, with how individuals are recruited to the studies and how variants are ascertained for the study uh, for the polygenic scores um, that, that can also uh, bias uh, GWAS 
effect sizes and polygenic scores in turn, um, which, which I'm not going to, to go into uh, at this point. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to loosely uh, refer to this uh, three uh, factors, uh, in, namely, you know, population structure from farming or certification, ascertainment, and dynastic effect as, as sad effect. Um, and, you know, importantly, the uh, sad factors or sad effects are not drawn to, to scale here uh, in the sense that, you know, after summing over all this uh, small GWAS correlation, uh, we really do not know for a given trait whether sad factors have a large or small effect. And this question should obviously affect our interpretation. Whenever sad factors have a large effect, uh, we should be extra careful not to interpret polygenic scores as uh, representing some genetic propensity and, you know, certainly not mutable or innate uh, genetic propensity. Um, even, you know, and even when all we're interested in is, uh, you know, high prediction power, all we're interested in is, in is prediction, when stat factors have a large effect, uh, we cannot assume that our polygenic scores will generalize well uh, beyond our GWAS sample. Uh, and this is simply because the sad effects are largely a function of the environment, of the environment and, and, you know, broadly defined. And therefore they may not, um, they may be, they may be very different outside of our GWAS sample, acting in very different ways. So what we found and the, the, you know, the next, uh, uh, cut to two methods that I'll uh, talk about. Um, you know, what we found is that this question of how big is the contribution of stat factors uh, can be addressed by comparing polygenic scores based on standard uh, GWAS, as we've discussed so far, and family studies such as CIP-GWAS. So a CIP-GWAS is, um, you know, a slightly different design where instead of having a sample of unrelated individuals and regressing their phenotypes to their genotypes, uh, we have a sample of speed pairs and we regress the phenotypic difference between a pair to their genotypic difference. Now, uh, for each of these uh, factors, uh, you know, that they will affect the two studies in different ways. And, you know, in particular, they will only affect an expectation the standard GWAS. So, for example, for indirect effect, um, we know that they'll be absorbed in the standard GWAS that we discussed. Uh, but in expectation, they will not uh, affect a C-based GWAS. Uh, so, you know, at least under the model where uh, the parental effects are largely the same for, uh, two, for the two SIDs, uh, when we take the difference in phenotype between SIDs, uh, the, the parental contribution is going to be canceled out. So, you know, all else being equal, the, the, uh, the difference in phenotype that we associate with the genotypic difference is going to stem from uh, direct genetic effect alone. So, you know, don't worry if you didn't follow the, the uh, specific example. The, the important general point is that uh, because the C-based design is looking within families, uh, we're, you know, naturally controlling for uh, parental and ancestral effects, and, and, and actually in expectation, all three uh, such set factors affect standard polygenic scores and not C-based uh, polygenic scores. And so, you know, we can therefore uh, leverage this uh, fact to uh, detect uh, the presence of set factors. So, you know, specifically what we, we did is, um, is apply the, the following study design to a range of traits, the traits in the UK biobank. So we take a sample of unrelated individuals and a sample of sibling pairs, and uh, we perform a GWAS uh, a standard GWAS in the unrelated sample, the GWAS in the, uh, in the second sample, and build two polygenic scores based on these, and then predict uh, the trait value in a third sample of unrelated individuals, uh, and measure the prediction accuracy, which I'm denoting by R squared here, uh, in this uh, third sample, and compare the prediction accuracy of the two. So, you know, what, what we, we do when we choose the sample size for the two uh, for the study is we choose them in a way that uh, matches the sampling error uh, between the two studies. And uh, what 
what meaning the the error that that uh, the average error that we get on a on an, uh, an individual effect estimate. And what this assures us is that if you know if sad factors have a small effect or or no effect on the polygenic score, uh, then what we expect is that the two polygenic scores will have equal prediction accuracy. So this is under the, the knowledge, you know. However, if uh, sad factors have a large effect, have the substantially affected polygenic score, then what we expect uh, is a higher prediction accuracy in the standard US-based polygenic score. So we apply this to a range of uh, traits uh, in the UK Biobank. And what I'm plotting on the x-axis here is the ratio of prediction accuracy uh, between the two uh, polygenic scores, where traits that deviate uh, to the left here are the ones where deviate from this horizontal, uh, from this vertical line, or ones where standard uh, geospace polygenic scores uh, outperform. So we can see that this trait includes physical traits such as height, uh, but you know perhaps most noticeably traits such as income, behavioral and social traits such as income, uh, smoking behavior, educational attainment, uh, and you know all of those traits that deviate to to the left are the ones where we detect a substantial uh, effect of uh, sad factors. Okay, so you know and and, and you know in all of this uh, we. Uh, what I mentioned earlier about our interpretation should uh, should apply. So, but but you know, but an important caveat that you know that I should mention here is that we should not overinterpret the the magnitude of the deviation to the left. Um, only whether a polygenic score here deviates uh, to the left or not. So this is this is simply because um, under the the null we we expect uh, you know if only direct genetic effects are at play. We expect the, the traits to fall on this uh, one to one ratio, um, but you know under the alternative, once one of the the uh, sad effects is at play, uh, at least one, then the magnitude of the deviation will depend both on the uh, magnitude of the effect, but but also uh, on other factors such as the heritability of the trait. And so you know many of the traits that show a large deviation are uh, also the less Heritable, uh, heritable traits. So, you know, we should only think of this uh, as a hypothesis test, uh, where you know the power differs between the, the different traits. Uh, but you know, to go beyond this hypothesis uh, testing approach, uh, my colleagues and I are currently working on uh, directly quantifying, you know, how much of the variance in a polygenic score. Uh, that we see in a sample can be attributed to uh, direct uh, effect variance and versus you know sad variance uh, the, the, and the covariance between the two, uh, as well as you know estimation noise in the in, in the different GWAS. So this is again based on a comparison of on, on using both uh, standard and the based GWAS, and uh, the idea is to you know this is a variance decomposition variable. Um, and our approach, you know, does not only let us uh, break down the, the variance in the polygenic score to uh, variance associated with direct effects, sad, sad effects, and, and so on, um, but we also get to uh, to do this uh, decomposition and to, to break it down, break it up to uh, projections along, um, uh, you know, projections of, of um, uh, into axis of uh, genetic variation. So uh, the decomposition breaks down also to uh, to the to each uh, variance component along that particular PC. So you know this work is still very preliminary, but uh, but given the, the you know the general story that uh, that I'm telling you today, I wanted to to show you just you know just one result uh, where what we get from such a decomposition when we revisit the high GWAS in the giant uh, meta-analysis. So what I'm showing here is the decomposition into variance components along, uh, I'm just showing the, the first uh, few uh, principal components. And the y-axis is showing you know, the variance components scaled by the, the total variance of the polygenic score. Um, and, 
and what we can see, you know, most notably here is that the SAD component on uh, PC2 uh, conferring specifically this PC compared to uh, North uh, South ancestry is, is quite huge. And, you know, together with the previous findings, uh, this really suggests that uh, the giant GOS is heavily confounded uh, along this axis and uh, perhaps uh, seals the, the, the deal on, uh, you know, signals of adaptation in height uh, being driven to a large extent or, or even entirely. Uh, by uh, some residual population structure confounding. So, you know, we started out with uh, why most adaptation in recent human history is is uh, quite likely polygenic, uh, and took a deep dive into the challenges of detecting polygenic adaptation. And, you know, in fact, any analysis of complex uh, human traits that leverages correlation from the entire genome. Uh, and we've also discussed, you know, how family studies may be a fruitful path forward uh, for telling apart uh, true causal direct genetic effects in polygenic scores uh, from other effects and, and compounders. So, you know, in the last few minutes today, uh, I would like to, you know, perhaps look beyond uh, the statistical challenges and Assume that we, you know, got rid of this um, pesky hat above the the, the G here, uh, namely that, um, you know, teasing apart uh, different confounders and side effects from a true uh, direct genetic effects is, is made possible. And let's further assume that, you know, that that we're looking at a fully additive trait where. Um, where, you know, what I'm calling the polygenic effect here is, is uh, well-defined. Namely, this is, you know, the total effect of one's genetics on uh, the trait. Uh, and, you know, again, it's independent from environmental effect. And um, and with this, you know, seemingly clean, simple, and interpretable uh, model, uh, what we would like to do is understand what a true signal of uh, polygenic adaptation means. So uh, we see, imagine we see, you know, a rapid shift from this blue distribution, say, to uh, a, a polygenic effect to uh, to a yellow distribution. Again, this is our polygenic effect, the, the real uh, effect. And that, that, you know, this shift is beyond what we might expect from uh, genetic drift alone. Uh, what does that mean? What does that tell us? So, you know, in addressing this question, I want to discuss Two points. Uh, first, uh, that you know, even in the simplest of models and simplest of cases, uh, complex traits are uh, determined by both genetic and environmental effects. So, in a rather you know trivial arithmetic sense, uh, genetic evolution alone does not tell us much about how phenotypes have evolved. So, you know, if we interpret uh, yellow to 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 blue uh, difference in polygenic scores as, you know, reflective of a similar change in phenotype, uh, what we're implicitly doing is assuming that, you know, the distribution of environmental effects is the same for both groups. Uh, in, you know, in human genetics, we, we typically have a rather poor handle on what the uh, environmental effect or the total environmental effect on a trait is composed of. Uh, and we have a, an even poorer handle on how uh, environmental effects differ uh, now or have differed historically uh, between between human groups. So, you know, just to span the, the range of uh, possibilities for this uh, simple case, uh, we could have that the uh, genetic difference uh, is acting, uh, you know, in an opposite direction of that of the environment, uh, maybe even a, in a similar magnitude. So this will sum up to uh, no differences at all at the phenotypic level. Uh, the genetic differences may point in uh, exact opposite direction of the, of the exact opposite direction of the, the phenotypic trend. Um, and, you know, we could, we could also have, um, you know, the genetic changes reflecting the, the phenotypic change in direction, but perhaps not in magnitude, uh, as we see in this case. 
Uh, and, you know, any interpretation is highly risky in the absence of very strong assumptions or knowledge about environmental effects. So, of course, you know, environmental effects can vary drastically across groups, geographically, over time or otherwise. Uh, but, you know, somehow, more often than not, uh, in comparisons of uh, population differences and population differences in polygenic scores, um, you know, environmental effects are implicitly assumed to, to be the same. So, you know, now to, to interpret polygenic adaptation specifically, there's an underlying question that uh, relates to the evolutionary mechanism behind this observation. Uh, namely, what are the, the possible models of, that, you know, we, we entertain for uh, phenotypic evolution to, to begin with? So I think, you know, in human population genetics, the two scenarios that the, the literature has focused on have been that the trait is either evolving neutrally in a population or instead that uh, the population is evolving to attain some some new trait optimum. However, you know, for for very interesting reasons that, um, you know, some of you in this virtual room uh, know increasingly uh, more about, but, but, you know, but I will have no, uh, I don't have time to, to go into, uh, it is, it is very possible that many traits are actually under stabilizing selection for a fixed optimal value, um, meaning that, you know, extreme values of the, the traits are always uh, selected again, and, um, and the, the optimum lies at some, you know, intermediate uh, uh, value or range. And, you know, a textbook example of this is, uh, of course, you know, birth weight in humans. And, you know, while stabilizing selection has received a, a century of attention in, in quantitative genetics, uh, that has not been the case in, in human genetics. And, you know, and again, you know, I won't have time to go uh, much deeper than this today, uh, but I wanted to bring forward this question uh, that we, we also discussed in our uh, recent perspective uh, about the hypothesis that many of the traits that we care about are under stabilizing selection for a fixed optimum and how it relates to the importance of the, the environment in interpreting group differences. Uh, most inter importantly in the context of our discussion today uh, is selection to uh, act to maintain a fixed uh, trait value, then it becomes quite likely that signals of polygenic adaptation often arise as some response or even to compensate for changes in environmental effects uh, rather than to attain some newly advantageous trait optimum. So this uh, only goes to, to emphasize again that the difficulty in mapping uh, um, genetics to, to phenotypes uh, without substantial uh, assumptions or knowledge about uh, environmental effects. All right, so in our three vignettes today, we, we discussed, you know, where we stand uh, in our pursuit to learn about polygenic adaptation in humans, uh, how this, you know, how this relates to, uh, to some really uh, far, um, far-reaching challenges in, in leveraging GWAS to learn about uh, complex traits and their history. And, you know, finally, that even if we forget about the statistical challenges, interpreting adaptation uh, in complex traits is, um, well, a complex, I guess. So, you know, lastly, I think that, you know, an overarching theme that uh, keeps popping up in, in the work that I presented today and my other work as well is um, how, you know, even when we consider the simplest model of independent contributions of GNE, uh, and even when we start out being interested in learning strictly about the genetics of a complex trait um, or the evolutionary genetics of a complex trait, uh, we simply cannot uh, get very far without a deep consideration of the, the environment uh, that affects the trait. So uh, before I end, I just wanted to, you know, to, to put in a quick plug to let you know that I'm uh, moving from uh, Columbia soon and opening uh, my own lab in a few months. And um, there will be, you know, a more official announcement with more details, such as the, the location, uh, out in a few weeks. But uh, in the meantime, if you think that you or a colleague may share some of our interests uh, and interested in working together, I would be uh, delighted to, to hear from you. So with that, I'd like to, again, acknowledge the, the people that I've been uh, fortunate to uh, work on on uh, all of this topic. 
and uh, I would be happy to take any questions.